welcome back to the 10th Breastfeeding Congress with the theme, Roadmap to Breastfeeding Success, Creating Systems for Lactation Support. We would like to welcome our moderator for the simultaneous sessions on advanced breastfeeding challenges, Dr. Laniza de Castro Hamoy. Dr. Hamoy took her Bachelor of Science in Basic Medical Sciences and Doctor of Medicine at the University of the Philippines College of Medicine. She took her Master of Science in Genetic Counseling at the University of the Philippines, Manila, and her Residency in Pediatrics and Fellowship in Genetics at the Philippine General Hospital. She is a current Associate Professor at the University of the Philippines, College of Medicine, and is a Fellow of the Philippine Pediatric Society. Again, we welcome Dr. Leah Hamoy. Our first speaker is an international board-certified lactation consultant. She's a graduate of Doctor of Medicine at St. Luke's College of Medicine, William H. Quasha Memorial. She had her pediatric residency training at National Children's Hospital. She's currently a lactation consultant in Center Medical International, Nurturey Breastfeeding Center, and SAA Healthcare, and a consultant and volunteer at Kalungsugan ng Mag-ina Incorporated. To discuss low milk supply, let us all welcome our first speaker, Dr. Joanne Datangel Gallardo. I am tasked to discuss low milk supply with you tonight, a topic that plagues most mothers and breastfeeding counselors alike. Before I start my lecture, I have no conflict of interest to declare. The objectives of my lecture are the following. According to the Academy of Breastfeeding Medicine, low milk supply, whether it be just perceived or actual, is considered one of the most common reasons for discontinuing breastfeeding. It is conditioned that is loosely defined as not producing enough breast milk to meet the baby's needs. However, one may ask, how much breast milk is enough? When I cannot measure my yield while my baby is latched, is this enough? Most mothers measure their breastfeeding success by comparing themselves to other mothers. Now with many mothers posting their breast milk stash on social media, we still have mothers asking the same question. Is this enough? While most health institutions have cut off values for everything, sadly, one of the most important human functions, such as breastfeeding, does not have cut off values to diagnose sufficient or insufficient breast milk supply. This lack of a rigid international definition of low milk supply leads to many mothers who think that they might have them. Perceived insufficient milk supply. Take this study for example. A systematic review was done in 2021, which studied 423 mothers who sought breastfeeding consult in Australia. The study results showed that 44% of the mothers who thought that they have low milk supply did so within three weeks of giving birth. And their most common reason, their infants did not seem satisfied. 66% also took matters into their own hands and started formula feeding before seeking consult. After targeted advice, however, most of these mothers had an improved breastfeeding journey with their infants. What does this study show? A mother's concern about low milk supply may commonly start in the mind. It may be aggravated by the infant's behavior and lack of support by the people around her. However, it may also immediately be improved by proper and targeted advice from a breastfeeding counselor or consultant. You may have heard the following complaints from mothers you have counseled. First, the baby feeds too often or starts to feed more frequently. The demands of the baby to feed vary in different times of the day, 
and this may still be normal. Sometimes they also experience growth spurts that may cause cluster feeding, which is temporary and does not necessarily mean low milk supply. Second, my breasts feel soft and does not harden anymore. After about the first three months of breastfeeding, the milk supply stabilizes slowly, causing breasts to be soft most of the time. This is more preferable by the baby too, as it makes it easier for him to take the breast. A breast that always feels hard signifies improper milk transfer and may cause pressure in the lotion that could lead to diminished milk supply. Third, the baby cries for hours. You know, there are many reasons why the baby cries. When the baby eventually cries due to hunger, although it may mean that the mother missed the earlier hunger cues that made the baby frustrated. I will discuss this further later. Next, the baby sleeps after a few minutes. When an older baby becomes proficient in breastfeeding, they only take a few minutes before they get satisfied. This may also be normal. And lastly, my baby shakes his head in front of my breast. Well, this does not mean that the baby is saying no. It is fairly common with newborn babies aiming at the breast, like trying to latch on a target that smells good and looks dark. Bullseye. Factors that influence PIMS. Another systematic review was done which determined the factors influencing perceived insufficient milk supply or PIMS. Most of these given factors can only be provided by health professionals and breastfeeding counselors. We are all guilty here. We have let many mothers down by not giving, doing, or due diligence in supporting something that is very important to them. What better way to give them the support they are due by arming ourselves with knowledge and skills necessary to circumvent PIMS? How important is breastfeeding initiation? Although breast milk production starts by the second half of pregnancy, its release or letdown, and subsequent increase in supply mainly starts shortly after birth and a few days thereafter. The delivery of the placenta triggers a rapid decrease in progesterone, which then triggers a sudden increase of the letdown hormone oxytocin and the milk-producing hormone prolactin. This in turn causes the release of the first form of breast milk, the scanty, nutrient-dense, and antibody-switch colostrum. This colostrum needs to be removed and transferred to the baby by way of direct breastfeeding, which is why early breastfeeding initiation is one of the most important first steps incorporated in unang yakap in helping the mother and the baby diet have the best start in breastfeeding. if not disrupted early on by supplementing with formula just because the midwife said, quote, unquote, the mother doesn't have enough breast milk, a newborn's stomach is just the size of a calamansi, small enough to receive the usual 5 to 15 ml of colostrum that the mother's body makes. By day 3 to 4, milk starts to mature, becomes more diluted, and have more volume. Breast milk production that was previously driven by the endocrine system gradually shifts to the autocrine system by the end of the first week. Effective stimulation of the nipple initiates action potentials in the hypothalamus, which then triggers release of oxytocin and prolactin. Simply put, breast milk production follows the law of demand and supply in that the more frequently the breasts are effectively stimulated, the more breast milk is produced. This is the positive feedback mechanism of lactation. Unsupplemented, however, the infant's stomach capacity only gradually grows bigger that studies say that it is only the size of a siniguelas by day three, the size of an average tamatis by one week of age, and the size of a chico by one month of age. If this is the case, therefore, why are many health professionals so adamant on giving at least three ounces of formula for feeding at first week of age?
since we cannot objectively measure a mother's milk supply at any given time, it is but right to enumerate the most reliable signs that the baby is taking in enough of the mother's breast milk. Let me preempt my discussion of the third lecture by also presenting here the mnemonic SUSO, so you can better remember the signs of sufficient milk supply. Look at the picture to the left. You can see that the baby is almost at the end of his feeding session. His body is relaxed, slightly flexed towards the mother's body, his eyes slightly closed, and his arm is relaxed on the mother's breast. You cannot see here, but his hand is not tightly fisted. Naturally, he lets go of the breast once satisfied, but some babies just keep nibbling on the breast. If the baby is removed from the breast, he will stay either comfortably asleep or comfortably awake. This is a picture of a satisfied feed. A baby who takes in enough will have at least six wet, not full diapers per day by the fifth to sixth day of life. The urine should be pale yellowish white and the volume must be enough to make the diaper heavier. Stool output may also be a reliable sign, but it differs at different stages of the baby's life. For as long as the stool output is sizable, does not cause too much discomfort, and comes regularly on a happy baby, combined with adequate urine output, it can tell us that the milk supply is enough. A baby who takes inadequate milk is a settled baby in between feeds. Breast milk is digested every one and a half to two and a half hours, hence making them hungry at the end of these intervals. And this is normal. In between, however, the baby must have moments that are comfortable whether asleep or awake and uh, consequently allowing them to get in touch with their parents and achieve their milestones without being irritable all the time. This is also a sign of sufficient milk supply. There must also be observable changes with the mother and the baby. Before feeding, the breasts may be engorged but soften after a feed. This signifies that the milk transfer is effective. The mother may also notice milk dripping on the other breast while the baby is latched. She may feel a comfortable tingling sensation from the base of the breast toward the areola like milk is flowing from the base to the nipple. These are signs of an active letdown reflex. A well-nourished baby also noticeably becomes fuller, rounder, and heavier. Now that we know what is normal, the question now is, how do we counsel a mother who has perceived insufficient milk supply? I believe that we should still graciously acknowledge the symptoms that they are feeling and not dismiss them outright. After giving them relevant breastfeeding knowledge and skills, they need to be reassured that breastfeeding is going well. If after thorough assessment, however, maybe after proper hand expression or observation of breastfeeding, it is indeed apparent that the mother has low milk supply and the baby is not gaining well because of it, it is now imperative that we determine the causes of actual milk supply, low milk supply. The most common cause of this is suboptimal breastfeeding. Suboptimal breastfeeding simply means that the mother may not be transferring milk or the baby is not taking in milk as effectively or as frequently as he should. Suboptimal breastfeeding has many causes. One of them is infrequent feeding. Studies show that the mother needs to feed directly 8 to 12 times per day in order to sustain or increase her breast milk supply. Breastfeeding less frequently than this can result to low milk supply. We can help them achieve 8 to 12 times of direct breastfeeding per day by practicing breastfeeding per demand and not by the hour. Looking at the baby and not the mother's watch. Breastfeeding per demand is more achievable if the mother knows how to recognize an infant's hunger cues. A baby can be fed way before he or she is crying out of hunger and frustration. She is already hungry 
if she turns her head from side to side, even with his eyes closed. She will turn her head to the side where the mother strokes her cheek and opens her mouth wide when, you're, when the mother touches her lips. She can be fed as early as then. The second stage is when her eyes are already open and you can see her wiggling her arms and legs while smacking her lips or sticking her tongue out. Now, as you can see, the pictures progress as the baby gets angrier by each stage, for which the last stage shows her frustratedly crying and may not want to feed until you calm her down. Feeding on the earliest hunger cue will facilitate better milk transfer and effective breastfeeding. Sometimes the baby seems hungry all the time but does not appear to gain, gain weight. Breastfeeding may be painful and cause milk stasis and infections. In my practice, 75% to 85% of mothers who come in due to ineffective suckling were due to improper positioning and attachment. Once this is resolved, the mother may notice instant improvement of the latch, effectively decreasing breastfeeding pain, deepening the latch, and consequently increasing the milk supply. This is where strengthening the mother's breastfeeding self-efficacy comes in. This mother came for consult because the baby seemed always disinterested and irritable while feeding. After demonstrating to her the four core skills of successful breastfeeding, which is a simplified approach to achieving a successful breastfeeding session each time, the mother returned demoed to me each step successfully through this picture. For the first time, the mother breastfed comfortably, semi-reclined with the support of pillows. You can see her hold securely supporting the baby's head and body. The baby's latch is anchored deeply to the breast. You can see the baby comfortably awake while latching her hands relaxed, and her body in a comfortable position as well. The mother continued to have more successful breastfeeding sessions after this, after learning these skills. At other times, due to culture or misinformation, the baby is given other fluids or food other than breast milk. This decreases the opportunity for the baby to latch directly to the mother, thereby decreasing milk supply. As a breastfeeding counselor, I would assess the baby's need for supplementation. If the baby is stable, however, not malnourished, and the mother is willing, I will encourage her to stop giving other milk and start direct breastfeeding 8 to 12 times a day. However, if absolutely needed, I would consider monitored supplementation via the drip drop technique and only using milk with the following hierarchy. With direct breastfeeding as the topmost priority, supplementation should be given conscientiously upon availability. Using the mother's own express breast milk first, if not available, followed by pasteurized donated breast milk, if not available, followed by donated milk from a well-known donor or a donor that uh, the mother trusts. And if not available, only considering formula milk as the absolute last resort. Sometimes, even if everything is done to correct the breastfeeding position and attachment, symptoms of ineffective latch persist. We need to carefully assess the cause. The mother of this baby sought consult because they were experiencing all of the listed symptoms above and the mother already started formula feeding because of the difficulty. However, they were too poor to even buy the cheapest formula milk and knew that she needs more expert help. Even though the baby could extend his tongue toward the gum line, a sign used to dispel oral ties by most health professionals, the frenulum under his tongue is clearly restricted and couldn't be lifted up towards the palate. This caused the persistent ineffective suckling and painful breastfeeding. To get the fighting chance of giving him proper nutrition, 
I suggested that he undergo a procedure called phrenotomy. I immediately scheduled and performed phrenotomy on other on the baby using surgical scissors. The procedure was quick with minimal bleeding. Apologies for the low lighting, but the picture on the left shows you a complete release with a good-sized diamond-shaped wound only exposing a part of the genuglossus muscle. If the release is incomplete, the symptoms may not resolve and infect ineffective latch may continue. However, as you can see on the second picture, two weeks after the procedure, you can see a newly formed frenulum at the base of the tongue, which is thin and flexible. This baby immediately exclusively breastfed after the procedure and has continued to breastfeed with complementary feeding until now at one year of age. This is another patient, Mira. Mira had one episode of choking as a newborn. At home, her latch was always shallow and painful to the mother. She also did not regain her newborn weight at one month old. See the way she latches only the tip of the nipple. Her suckle is fast and her swallow is not coordinated. On the next video, you will find me properly assessing for any ties and lo and behold, after I saw a thick frenulum at the middle part of her tongue. After much consideration, her parents agreed to having a phrenotomy done. You can see the frenulum there. It's quite thick. next now you can see the difference of the top pictures before the tongue tie release or phrenotomy and the bottom pictures two to three months after the release respectively baby mira likewise never received any supplementation but gained the well through direct breastfeeding only after the phrenotomy now she is a three-year-old well-nourished kid Maternal factors that cause actual low milk supply are extremely rare, but they exist. It is important to exhaust any possible causes of low milk supply first before even considering maternal factors. If diagnosed, though, it is important to assure the mother that breastfeeding is still possible, especially with proper management and support. Since the conditions are extremely rare, I would only discuss them in passing in the interest of time. In my years of practice and seeing some of the most difficult cases, I only ever saw two mothers out of hundreds of them who have insufficient glandular tissue. During history taking, these mothers claimed that their breasts did not develop nor enlarge even during pregnancy. Their milk supply marginally increased in the first week after birth. During physical examination, um, I could I have seen uh, one of them had a space between the medial aspect of the breast was greater than four centimeters. In other cases, the breast may be bulbous or asymmetrical. Direct breastfeeding was maintained in their cases in the first six months by frequent breastfeeding and with conscientious supplementation. We used either drip drop technique or alternative feeding method, but never a bottle. And uh, I also considered use of an effective evidence-based galactagog. After six months and with the help of complementary feeding, formula supplementation was gradually removed and the babies thrived with breastfeeding combined with healthy complementary feeding. Studies show that breastfeeding eventually become better in subsequent births, and some were even able to exclusively breastfeed thereafter. This is something that my two patients are looking forward to. Some endocrine conditions such as diabetes, thyroid problems, polycystic ovarian syndrome, cause a delay in lactogenesis too, 
which we now know happens immediately at birth up to day 7 to 10. This is usually temporary and resolves as soon as their medical condition is controlled with the help of their specialists, which is why early referral is needed to treat their condition. While waiting, the mothers may be encouraged to continue frequent direct breastfeeding and only if needed, supplement via the drip drop method and remove the supplementation when no longer necessary. A lactation consultant is really needed in these cases, but can help augment the mother's milk supply. We should remove supplementation when no longer necessary. With the advent of state-of-the-art management of postpartum hemorrhage, this condition, severe postpartum hemorrhage, is, has managed to be exceedingly rare. According to studies, postpartum hemorrhage of more than 500 milliliters could cause hypopituitarism and subsequent very low milk supply. If volume loss is not recovered immediately, the milk supply is usually severely affected. Some reports still show that some breastfeeding is possible, but supplementation is almost always needed. I would still support the mother's wish to breastfeed by encouraging her to direct breastfeed with supplementation and maybe sometimes use alternative milk feeding as needed. Rarely and with the clearance of an attending physician, prescribed antidopaminergic medications may be used to augment milk supply in effective doses. It is also important to help them come up with realistic goals with the intention of achieving it. Knowing now the proper ways of managing low milk supply, the following are recommendations that we should avoid because they are counterproductive and undermines breastfeeding of an already anxious mother. One of them is dismiss a mother who has perceived insufficient milk supply right there and then saying, okay lang yan mami, normal lang yan ni. Diba? And then, um, recommend buying a breast pump and graded bottles to measure milk supply. This is counterproductive. Why would you tell them to buy uh, 20,000 pesos breast pump or even bottles just to see how much they can yield? Um, I would rather make them invest on diapers, you know, and just continue direct breastfeeding and continuously monitored by a lactation consultant or a breastfeeding counselor. And of course, uh, I would avoid recommending formula feeding when things get tough and uh, buying a weighing scale just to uh, monitor the daily weight. That's counterproductive because the weight um, differs at each time of the day. And there are many methods that uh, can be done to measure it reliably, like um, measuring the weight at the same time of the day. And if you have done it first uh, after feeding, it should be also done second day after feeding, something like that. So it is counterproductive and it will only increase the anxiety of the mother. So let's not do that. In conclusion, low milk supply is one of the most common causes of discontinuing breastfeeding. Perceived insufficient milk supply is common but can be avoided by breastfeeding initiation, increasing breastfeeding knowledge, and self-efficacy. And lastly, management of actual milk supply requires thorough assessment, immediate referral and treatment, and continuous breastfeeding support. With that, thank you very much for listening. Our second speaker is a graduate of Bachelor of Science in Nursing at Adventist University of the Philippines. She has a PhD in Nursing at Our Lady of Fatima University and a Diploma in Cleft Care Scientific Research at Universidad de San Martín de Porres in Peru. She is an international board-certified lactation consultant and certified breastfeeding specialist, a breastfeeding and infant feeding specialist at Smile Train Philippines, and lactation consultant at Baby Doodoo Docs, child and breastfeeding care specialists. To talk about specialized nursing algorithm for infants with clefts, let us all welcome Dr. Maria Julita Sibayan. 
Hello everyone. My name is Maria Julita San Joaquin Sibayan. I am a registered nurse and an associate professor at the Adventist University of the Philippines and a practicing international board certified lactation consultant. I am pleased to be sharing with you the specialized nursing algorithm for cleft infants. I declare no financial relationships past or current with entities that manufacture and distribute alcohol, tobacco products, breast milk substitute, baby foods, and other products covered by the EO51 or the Philippine Milk Code, as well as the International Code of Marketing for Breast Milk Substitutes. The photos that will be presented to you in this talk were, were taken from the Baby Doodoo Docs Child and Healthcare uh, Breastfeeding Specialist Clinic through Smile Train Philippines. Virtual and in-clinic feeding nutrition services for cleft is funded by Smile Train Philippines. I open my short presentation with this adage popularized by Mary Kay Ash or Andre St. Lad. The adage, bumblebees shouldn't be able to fly, was based on calculations using the aerodynamic theories in the, 18, in the 1918s and 1919s, just about 15 years after the Wright brothers first made their powered flight. This early theory suggested that bumblebee wings are way too small for, uh, for them to be able to develop the lift needed for flight. I often say this to the parents when they come to me for consult, and many have become inspired by this little quote, citing our little cute bumblebees. I refer to this adage because we recognize how breastfeeding is part of a pre-programmed response that we as mammals were born with. Humans, in fact, have maintained uh, have mammalian instincts rather, and reflexes that allow us to root and find the breast. This holds true to all babies, cleft or no cleft. Sadly, our over anticipation of difficulty is what limits the establishment of this important milestone that is the establishment of breastfeeding, a crucial step in mother infant relationships. To further bring my point across, allow me to share one of the babies I've met through Smile Train, that is Baby C, who at the time of the consult was three weeks old. After guiding the mom, discussing what breastfeeding can do and why it is still the best feeding option for her, we guided the mom properly position the child, explain to her what adjustments need be done for baby to develop the needed uh, suction for breastfeeding. While the baby, baby C, has complete unilateral cleft lip and palate, as you can see in the video I'm flashing right now, baby was able to suck away and breastfeed like a champion. This is just like a bumblebee who have not been told of the impossibilities its little wings um, can have, uh, the effect of the little wings it has on its ability to fly. Okay, so see, it's really, really a wonderful sight to see. We have been working with uh, Smile Train since February 2021. And all in all, we have seen 219 uh, mother baby diets with cleft of all the consults the top concerns that were often um, shared to us were the following factors they wanted to know the factors leading to the cleft often this also comes with parental guilt parents wanted to know how they would be able to care and manage their child with cleft many parents pregnant and even after giving birth would ask how can they breastfeed their child? And what would be the best way to maintain uh, their breastfeeding despite of the anatomic challenges a cleft child would have? Alternative feeding methods are also top concerns we often address because we understand that we should also give 
alternative feeding options and alternative practices that would enable and ensure that the child is fed given the uniqueness of the condition their baby has. We often see moms who after experiencing a failure in breastfeeding or having been told that they cannot breastfeed or after uh, formula feeding realize that it, it brought on new challenges and decided to give breastfeeding a shot. And so relactation is also one of those things that we often help the families with. Many babies have feeding challenges and Sam and Mam or slow weight is one of the things that we also manage and handle. For babies who have been formula fed or mixed fed, health concerns that often we address would be gastrointestinal disturbances, respiratory tract infections, and even conditions in the skin. As they grow and as they wait for the another round of surgeries, complementary feeding also is one of the things that we provide. Complementary feeding um, counseling are one of the things that we address through the consultations that we have for families with left. As a nurse, we were trained to identify and diagnose the client's responses to the uniqueness of the condition that they have. The nursing diagnosis is the clinical judgment that we nurse, we nurses use, um, we formulate about the responses of the individual, the family, or the community to the vital conditions or processes they may have. In accordance with this judgment, the nurse will be responsible for monitoring the patient's responses, making decisions that will culminate in a care plan, and for the implementation of interventions, including interdisciplinary collaborations and referrals. Um, this would be done taking into consideration the uniqueness of the individual. So the following were the diagnoses that we often um, have for patients with uh, cleft. For the, the, for the parents, they would often have deficient knowledge. Parents would often come willing to be taught and to be guided how they can improve their parenting. Problems with breastfeeding, both um, in effectivity and um, its maintenance are common um, nursing diagnoses that we make. Um, risk and actual problems in terms of nutritional imbalance. Um, are common. We also have, given the uniqueness of their anatomy, we have ineffective airway clearance um, as a diagnosis, risk for aspiration as a diagnosis, impaired tissue integrity, uh, post-operatively, risk for infection both pre-op and post-op. Under our time with Smile Train, we saw the direction, we saw the track, we saw the conditions that we see. And it, it was because of this that with Dr. Me and Silvestre, we were able to come up with this specialized nursing algorithm that zones in on the care for cleft babies. The specialized nursing algorithm is a clinical or a clinician support tool to be used by skilled birth attendants, midwives, nurses, and doctors in the community in keeping with the Universal Health Care Act of 2019 or the Kalusugan it serves as a form of guideline implementation tool or GIT that highlights key decision points in the delivery of care for babies with cleft lip, cleft palate, or both in their families in the context of antenatal, intrapartal, and postpartal periods. And this is very useful both in the community and hospital settings. So this is a range um, in a uh, algorithm flow as opposed to a prose um, format. This is a product of our work uh, as a lactation consultant, as a feeding specialist, cognizant of the gaps in rendering care while serving uh, Smile Train Philippines. We know that Smile Train Philippines is that international children's charity that supports 100% free cleft repair surgery and comprehensive cleft care for children globally. We also aspire for this algorithm to be an educational resource to equip care providers for Smile Train and beyond Smile Train 
as we see um, its impact, how it shapes the health outcomes of its beneficiaries. While this is currently adapted by Smile Chain Philippines, other Smile Chain organizations in different parts of the world have seen this as a benchmark and is currently in the works of adopting these guidelines in their own countries. We aspire uh, for this algorithm to institutionalize a systematic evidence-based and holistic flow of care for cleft infants and their families that promotes, protects, and supports optimal nutrition for the first 1,000 days as evidenced by increasing breastfeeding rates among cleft infants. We also want to have a reduction of undernutrition rates, which is also another pressing problem in, in the cleft population. Because we know that if the foundation for health, and that is nutrition, is not safeguarded, there is a delay in cleft repair. Okay? We aspire for timely surgical cleft repair because this improves significantly the post-surgical outcomes within the six months of its full implementation with the algorithm widely embraced and used in practice. Okay? The specialized nursing algorithm also aspires to elevate the competencies of the care providers and the skilled birth attendants, both in the community and hospital settings. The algorithm is um, cr was created um, considering the Society of Medical Decision-Making Committee on the standardization of clinical algorithms. As you can see, we have used four types of boxes. Um, the first one being the clinical state box, which comes in the re uh, rounded rectangle. This box defines the clinical state or the problem. Then we have the decision box, which is hexagon in shape. This requires a branching decision whose response will lead to one or two alternative paths. Um, usually it's answerable by a, by a yes or a no. And then we have the action box, which is a rectangle. This box indicates an action commonly, either therapeutic or diagnostic. And then we have the link box, which is a small oval. This box is used in place of an arrow to um, ensure graphic clarity. We also use arrows. Usually algorithms flow from um, top going down, top to bottom, left to right, depending on the responses based on the decision box. So we start with pregnancy. Um, antenatally, we, we often see um, clients who are told that they are expecting a child with cleft and that is seen through the routine scan. Upon scanning, if it is seen that the child would have cleft, we then proceed with facilitation of family education on cleft, um, genetic counseling, and psychosocial counseling as needed. However, in some settings, it is rather impossible for us to be able to uh, see and the population that we often serve have not had uh, the opportunity for a scan. Uh, um, generally, for pregnancy, we facilitate for families to receive the prenatal counseling focusing on the breastfeeding initiation or the unang yaka. Okay? And we want that to be facilitated early on. But let me um, direct your attention first on the prenatal counseling. Okay. The, if you see a picture, uh, the scan picture on the right, that is one of our smile trained babies whose mom has been told that they are expecting a baby with cleft at 27 weeks AOG. Um, I remember the mom was crying upon finding out this finding. But um, we had a prenatal counseling session then. According to Marokakis et al., significant, um, a significant decrease in anxiety following prenatal counseling was reported by parents in this study that looked into a systematic review of literature. Um, we know that prenatal diagnosis of fetal anom anomalies may often arouse fear and anxiety and distress among parents. And it is through counseling that we may be able to 
help them cope with the diagnosis. We are able to patch them up with support that they need. Um, we are able to um, empower them to know what is ahead of them. And that is why we include um, prenatal counseling early on and we facilitate as soon as the parent is made aware. However, in cases when uh, babies are not aware or if the mother is expecting, we often spend time talking about um, what is to be expected and that's why we also emphasize the value of early essential newborn care and I know we have been talking about this time uh, many times over and we know that the early essential newborn care is a gold standard of intrapartum care that employs time-sensitive interventions that improve maternal and infant outcomes um, through these four core steps. Okay. So whether the baby is expected to have cleft or we have not yet find, found out that the baby is in fact going to be born with cleft, it is still important that the early essential newborn care is done and um, explained as part of the counseling sessions. And so we have the baby born already. For some, it is the first time we are finding out that the baby has cleft. Or for others, we are, have been expecting. Upon the delivery, we first check if the child has cleft. If the baby has, um, has been born with cleft, and it was the first time that we are finding out, we go back to box number three on the top and facilitate for counseling education uh, to be done. However, if, for example, the baby was born with cleft and we find out, we then now consider um, the, the condition of the child at birth. Is the baby un, unstable? Is the baby stable? We do the EINC. Okay, so the same, facilitating it as if it were not a cleft, I believe. But when the baby is un, um, unstable and um, breastfeeding initiation might have to be postponed, it is important. Okay, for mothers to be facilitated to express their own breast milk. And so hand expression is one of the things that we teach the moms to do. And I share a photo from Breastfeeding Care Center of the North where a mother is performing um, hand expression and she was harvesting her colostrum, which may be given to the infant. Okay. So it has been said that early ha hand expression led to 96% uh, percent success rates in breastfeeding mothers at two months postpartum compared to those who were just pumping. As a clinician, I find that um, guiding the moms to hand express early on also facilitates them, um, also shows them that they already have the milk and, they, and that in turn will also jumpstart and trigger. Um, the breastfeeding as soon as they are able to be uh, united again for them to be able to breastfeed. And so after um, breastfeeding is started, okay, we, we want to maintain that the first, um, the, the golden hour or the first, uh, that the, the mother and the baby is not separated. Okay, so that we be able to facilitate breastfeeding. We would be able to delay some of the routine care that is being done. We only do this after the time that the um, first successful breastfeed has been uh, successfully completed by the mother-infant diet. The routine care includes eye ointment. Yeah, we do the... PE or the palatal examination, which often in some countries they do this first, which already starts the, the separation of the mother infant, which may have an impact in the breastfeeding initiation. As much as possible, um, we feel that this can be delayed. While others might argue that aren't we not um, increasing the risk for uh for aspiration if we delay um, palatal examination, we can very well remind okay, our, ourselves that 
this, although integral part of the routine care, may be done okay, within 24 hours of birth. Okay? Um, this is best done. I, I believe that timing is best done after giving the initial vaccination, say, for HEPA or vitamin K. And as the baby cries loud after the administration of the injection, we can very well visualize. Okay? We can very well visualize and see the the integrity of the hard and the soft palate of the child without having to disrupt the breastfeeding. Okay. So we use a torch method where we depress the tongue, okay, and we visualize the whole the whole palate. There will be minimal risk for aspiration. First, we have to remember that at that time of birth, babies will only take small amounts of milk and mothers would have drops of colostrum, which is relatively thick. Babies would just have um, trophic feedings. And so the risk really isn't, isn't very, very high. Okay, um, Babies need at the first day, their first two days of life, just one ml per kilogram body weight of uh, one ml of milk per kilogram body weight um, if we are going to be very strict with computations. So we have to choose wisely between the risk of aspiration, which is very unlikely, and the risk of increasing breastfeeding failure rates, mother and child morta mortality rates, and the, with the result of not being able to um, facilitate the golden hour or when the EINC is not done. Okay. Now, in the event that mothers would have to, uh, so th now that we have seen, okay, the baby has been born with cleft, we have done our part of initiating. Part of our job also is to ensure that babies would be able to be, uh, would be able to be fed uh, with the mother's breast milk, whether it has to be expressed due to um, the difficulty brought on by the cleft. And this is where introduction and guidance with alternative infant feeding methods are done. And on the slide that I'm showing you, we have several um, feeding methods that we use. Okay? According to Farouk and Mirizi, Okay, in 2022, feeding difficulty is usually the most serious and urgent concern after birth in children with cleft lip and palate. Um, it can be very difficult. No, It might be difficult for them. However, caregiver education is critical for success for any infant feeding strategy. And that is why we want to equip the parents by showing them alternative feeding methods, many of which are just readily available. Um, most of the families we service belong to the lower uh, class families who cannot and do not have access to specialized feeding bottles. But in reality, a spoon may be used, a dropper may be used, cup feeders may be used, syringe with OGT may be used, which is relatively um, cheaper and more accessible for parents. In Smile Train, we provide the Nifty Cup okay, over here. And... Um, in a study done uh, in 2019 by McKinney et al., mothers prefer the Nifty Cup to a medicine cup for supplemental foods for their babies. Okay? Um, cup feeding is still a, a very important uh, alternative method. Okay? And it just needs proper guidance okay, from skilled supporters. If we can teach them in the clinic, I handle many of the patients and many of the patients we service um, teach, you know, the grandparents, the father, and even their nannies to use the cup so that feeding wouldn't be a problem. One advantage I find with the use of or with educating parents about alternative feeding methods early on is that when post-operative, um, post-operatively, they will not have struggles with feeding the infant because the baby already knows, the family already knows how to use the nutrita. Many surgeons do not prefer for babies to have uh, uh, to use the bottles okay, right after surgery, but they only allow the use of cup or spoon 
or anything that does not have a pressure on the suture sites. So if parents already know early on how to use nifty cups, they will not have a struggle post-operative. So here's Smart Train Baby C, three months old at the time of consult, whose repair has been done already at 11 months. And you can see the mother was very good at using um, the nifty cup uh, to feed her child with her expressed breast milk. Okay, so a nifty cup is a promising feeding cup for um, infant feeding who would have difficulties. Okay, I think the key word here is anticipatory guidance. If only we are able to guide the families well, feeding wouldn't be a problem for them. Okay, so I'm after um, proper guidance with feeding and counseling, we continue on with growth monitoring and development because there are certain um, guidelines that have to be met. There are certain uh, parameters that should be satisfied. You know, we have the rule of nines, um, rule of tens rather, that has to be um, satisfied okay, by, by the, the child in order for them to qualify for surgery. And that is why continuous contact with these families, um, guidance with feeding, okay, complementary feeding at six months is done. Okay? But I think a very important player here would be for them to be able to, to find a local support, okay, a parenting support group, which often is initiated upon um, the facilitation of counseling services. So I think that's why um, we were able to be successful at navigating okay, the, the challenges with feeding because the parents are often um, partnered with a local mother support group who not only provides that emotional and peer support about breastfeeding, they also would be more than willing to share some of their breast milk if there are nutritional um, uh, needs the baby has okay, when, they're, when they're not uh, growing the way we would want them. So it's important that they have that peer support. In ending, let me share some of our successes. If you remember the story of the mom who was crying after finding out through ultrasound that they are expecting a child with cleft. So upon um, the diagnosis, prenatal counseling was done. The mother was taught um, about breastfeeding. She was given anticipatory guidance. And because of that, okay, she was able to breastfeed the baby. We were able to facilitate and hook them up with the dentist to help with the NAM. Okay, and even with the NAM in close, they were facilitated and guided to breastfeed while they were taught how to use cup feeders. Okay, so as you can see, after the surgery, cup feeding was done. And so now we are seeing the baby soon for surgery, this time for the repair of the cleft. Okay. Another one of our baby is baby J. Okay. At the time of consult, baby J was 28 days old and have been previously hospitalized due to aspiration. Um, at the time when we met baby J, he only weighed 2.8 kilograms when his birth weight was 3.6. Through continuous guidance, hooking them up with mother support groups who shared breast milk as we help rehabilitate baby J, and with a complementary started a complementary feeding started at six months, we saw a steady gain from two point eight to three point four uh, after a month to four kilograms after a month, four point eight at five months, seven point seven kilograms at eight months. And that was when baby J was able to qualify for the surgery. So what did we learn? What an amazing fact about the story is that the mother even had to undergo relactation just to, just to be able to provide baby J with the much-needed milk. But um, what did we learn in the process of handling these cases? 
Number one, we under, we realize that theft care should be client-centered and comprehensive. And that is what Smile Train aspires to do. And this, that is what is highlighted by the algorithm that I have shown and discussed with you. Education and counseling early on is very, very important. Proximity and availability of skilled help is also paramount to the success of the diet. We need to strengthen the support base that we afford our families. And we have to align multidisciplinary and collaborative approaches because it's only then that we are able to move forward together and achieve goals and outcomes faster. Okay, so again, I am quoting Lawrence Miller and it says the alignment and vision and teamwork at the interface between basic science and clinical medicine builds on complementary strengths of both institutions with the critical goal of bringing value to healthcare and our patients. In closing, I am quoting Rebecca Schnau and she says, I often see myself as the patient's voice. As nurses, we have the advantage of being closely involved in patient's care and can often best understand both the patient experience and how they interface with the healthcare system. It is my goal and my prayer that somehow in the days to come, we strengthen the support that we afford our CLEF families. And perhaps through this short talk, we multiply more the efforts and we ensure together that we move forward towards better breastfeeding goals for the unique population of cleft families. Thank you very much for your time. Our next speaker already shared her extensive knowledge on low milk supply to us earlier this afternoon. We're very lucky that she has graciously agreed to speak to us twice today. And so to discuss relactation, let us all welcome once again, pediatrician and international board certified lactation consultant, Dr. Joanne Datangel Gallardo. Good evening, everyone. It is my honor to discuss with you a topic that is considered daunting to all of us, especially to the healthcare professionals and the breastfeeding counselors. This topic is about relactation. Before I start my lecture, I have no conflicts of interest to declare. And for the objectives of my lecture at the end of the session, uh, I aim to discuss the benefits of relaxation, to present the process of relaxation and how it is done, and to provide tips in ensuring relaxation success. So the DOST FNRI reported a slight increase in the rates of breastfeeding practices in 2021 compared to those in 2018. 72.4% of mothers who gave birth initiated breastfeeding within the first hour, while exclusive breastfeeding within the first six months increased by 4%, and continued breastfeeding at two years old increased by 7% from a stagnant rate in the past six years. This is a welcome side effect of the pandemic as many mothers who have given birth stayed with their babies for a longer period of time due to unexpected lockdowns. But the positive report ends there. If we zero in on the exclusive breastfeeding rate within the recommended six months of age, a 4% increase is considered a minute change. We could still see that four out of 10 mothers who gave birth in 2021 discontinued breastfeeding prematurely. So what happened to them and what influenced them to give up? We find five common reasons for early discontinuation of breastfeeding. The first two can be attributed to the care given to the mother and baby or lack thereof. And the other three can be attributed to the mother's lack of breastfeeding knowledge and support received from others around her. During the peak of the pandemic, most mothers who have given birth were separated from their babies, awaiting a negative swab before they can be roomed in. We all now know that this step is counterproductive as it only increases the risk of COVID-19 transmission from the caregivers to the baby. It also effectively misses the golden opportunity of initiating breastfeeding within the first hour of life. A crucial step 
in establishing breastfeeding within the diet and decreasing risk of sepsis. Many mothers who gave birth in the hospital or lying in clinics also reportedly never received breastfeeding care and had zero knowledge about breastfeeding when they get home. Persistent breastfeeding pain also, most probably due to incorrect positioning and attachment, causes some of them to give up. Others may have started breastfeeding really well, only to compare their milk supply to another mother. And when they think that they were not at par, they discontinued prematurely. Mothers who suffered from postpartum depression also, without receiving any emotional or medical support, discontinued breastfeeding early. A point to ponder. Nowadays, we can no longer say that this, the decision to formula feed mainly comes from the mother's whim. In fact, most pregnant mothers in the Philippines desire to exclusively breastfeed for as long as they want to, only for health professionals and family fail them. The truth is, relactation should be at the end of the spectrum of breastfeeding intervention. It must be emphasized that relactation wouldn't have been necessary if breastfeeding is adequately protected, supported, and promoted. This should have been done even before the mother gives birth. When all is said and done, however, mothers still look to us health professionals and counselors for help to relactate. Why should we at least try to lead the mothers to relactate? Needless to say, bringing back the baby to the breast promotes stronger mother and baby bonding, giving the parents greater financial control as they do not need to buy costly formulas and bottles anymore. It also affords the mother the satisfaction of achieving her feeding goals for the baby, aside from reaping most, if not all, the benefits of breastfeeding. Nutrition is also achieved sustainably and equitably without being dependent on the parent's economic status. Even before the pandemic, more and more mothers wanted to relactate. The picture on the right was proof of that, taken in 2016, where I was counseling these mothers whose babies were admitted in the hospital due to pneumonia, diarrhea, or sepsis. These mothers wanted to relactate their babies knowing full well that breastfeeding lessens the baby's risk of getting sick. Relactation in the Philippine community have existed even before, but it had been largely anecdotal, unrecognized by the medical and scientific community, making doctors skeptic of its feasibility. Also, existing international relactation techniques require the use of breast pump, express breast milk, galactagogues, and other costly paraphernalias, things that most Filipinos cannot afford to have, especially in the grassroots level. One of the widely accepted relaxation protocol is that of Dr. Jack Newman and Liner Goldfarb, which is mainly based on the positive feedback mechanism of lactation. This mechanism simply tells us that more frequent direct breastfeeding stimulates greater milk production. We love Dr. Newman's protocol because it is one of those that are effective. Be that as it may, since this protocol is used in Western countries, it made use of galactagogues and breast pumps that their insurances could easily provide. This not, may not be applicable in many country settings, especially with mothers in the grassroots level, such as ours. It is for this reason that in 2016, I thought of a research study that may, may fill this gap of knowledge. What techniques, if put together, could be used to bring back babies to their mother's breasts without the benefit of costly products that is not available in our country? This study, a novel relaxation program among bottle feeding in patients in a tertiary public hospital in the Philippines, propelled all of the knowledge and skills that I will share with you today. As the methodology and outcomes have been proven replicable, sustainable, and equitable by the hospital we have done it in, and by many other health professionals and breastfeeding counselors who have asked for my guidance. So what is relaxation? 
We define relactation in our study as the process of re-establishing lactation after initial discontinuation. It also involves two challenging processes. First, bringing the baby back to the breast despite getting used to the bottle. And second, establishing or re-establishing milk supply. After strictly recruiting those mothers with zero to almost six months infants who were purely formula fed, and these mothers who have little to no express breast milk, we subjected our respondents to a 21-day relactation intervention period and determined how many succeeded in the end. I would like to emphasize that no feeding bottles, no breast pumps, no galactagogues were used in our study. The outcomes of the study astounded us because out of the 35 finishers of the study, 34 successfully relocated. Out of the 34, 25 of them were exclusively breastfeeding already by day 21, while nine were still mixed feeding and only one failed to relocate. For secondary outcomes, contrary to the findings of other international relocation studies, Ours found that it only took an average of four days before an increase in hand express breast milk was noted, and it only took four to six days until the baby goes back to the breast and achieve at least two unsupplemented direct breastfeedings, an outcome that we tag as partial relactation success. Furthermore, we have observed that the babies who relocated successfully gained an average of 35 grams per day after a few days, an acceptable weight gain rate for pediatricians like us. It is also interesting to note that upon relocation success, the average volume of manually expressed breast milk among these mothers at any given time was just 30 ml. It proves that the volume of milk one can express is not a true reflection of a mother's milk supply. You can also tell that to your patients. And contrary to the findings in previous international studies, that the older the babies or the longer they are bottle fed, it will take them longer before they can go back to breastfeeding. Our studies find the contrary. It finds that there are no correlation between the lactation gap and in infant's age. Now you may wonder why I presented my study's outcomes first. Well, maybe it is to convince you that with the proper determination and dedication of both the mother and the healthcare professional or the counselor, you can help your patients to relocate too. So, brace yourself with your pen and paper because I will now take you to the elements of successful relocation. Back in April 2020, Dr. Rasibayan, Nurse Casino, and I uploaded a two-hour-long lay forum about relactation, which garnered hundreds of interested responses by mothers and doctors alike, which is why we came up with a very conspicuous mnemonic. The term balik suso can help you remember the important steps towards relactation and the signs that it is going well. So for the first element, the first B stands for breastfeeding education. It is one of the most important first steps to give relevant knowledge to the mothers to eventually lead them to decide whether they are interested to embark on relaxation or not. You must be able to discuss the advantages of breastfeeding, the disadvantages of not breastfeeding, the positive feedback mechanism of lactation, recognizing a baby's hunger and satiety cues, proper positioning and attachment, and of course, basic breastfeeding and relaxation skills. Another B stands for breastfeed eight to 12 times a day. Yes, you heard it right. There's no other way to bring a bottle fed baby back to the breast, but to practically reintroduce the baby to the breast. We can support their nutrition by supplementing via the drip drop technique. So what is drip drop technique? So with the use of either a spoon, a dropper, or a needle syringe, milk is dropped on the mother's breast and allowed to drip 
onto the corner of the baby's mouth. This tricks the baby of the source of copious milk and encourages him to suckle more vigorously. The vigorous suckling will then trigger the increase of the milk producing hormone prolactin, which will also trigger more lactation. It also influences the increase in the hormone oxytocin, which will trigger the milk let down reflex. Eventually, supplementing may be decreased as mother's milk supply increases and the baby shows satiety more readily. I consider this element as the rate limiting step of relaxation. Determined mothers who attempt to breastfeed 8 to 12 times a day every day, despite the difficult first days, achieve more or less 4 to 10 days before relaxation. Of course, results may still vary depending on many factors. When you counsel your uh, mother and baby diet, it may take them longer or it may take them shorter. It really depends on their context. Next is A, ayusin ang hakab at posisyon. The key to effective transfer of breast milk will always be proper positioning and attachment. We make our practice at nursery breastfeeding center simpler by emphasizing four core skills of, of breastfeeding. First, whether it be cradle, cross cradle, under arm hold or side lying position, the mother should always find herself comfortable. She must be holding the baby securely with his entire body facing hers, his face facing her breast. The neck should not be twisted and the head should be positioned as if he is drinking. There should be nothing in between the baby's mouth and the mother's breast. In this video, you can see the mother was not leaning forward. The baby's entire body is facing her body and the baby's torso and the lower limbs almost wrapping around the mother's body, a term in Filipino we call salungkipkip. The third core skill is precise approach, which means gently but swiftly bringing the baby towards the shape breast once he opens his mouth. Bring the chin to touch the breast tissue first in order to anchor an asymmetric latch. This is the fourth core skill, an anchored latch. You can see in this video that the mother's swift movement on an eager baby who opens his mouth towards the breast brings the baby correctly to the breast. And after a second try, the baby can now be seen drinking well with slow suckles and swallow. The breastfeeding then became less painful and more comfortable for the mother. Let's see that again. There you go. You can see the baby slow suckle and swallow. And you can see the baby readily latches too. Next. S, balik, so letter L. So, L stands for lactation skills. So, there are two important lactation skills, namely manual breast milk expression and self-breast massage. Relactating mothers should be taught to do manual breast milk expression, both to express and store breast milk, and also to help drain milk for whenever the baby absolutely refuses to breastfeed directly. So here is a video teaching you how to do hand expression ay isang skill na mahalagang matutunan ng isang ina hindi lamang upang makapag-imbak ng maraming gatas sa pagbalik sa kanyang trabaho kundi para din matulungan ng kanyang sarili na mabawasan ang paninigas o pamamaga ng suso kapag ito ay napupununan ng gatas. Tuwing ang nanay ay mag-hand express, kailangan siya ay relaxed, komportable, may intention lamang para masanay sa skill na ito at hindi na pe-pressure na makapag-ipon ng maraming gatas. Kung lagi namang kasama ng ina ang kanyang sanggol, mas mainam na direct breastfeeding ang gawin, 
dahil hindi hamak na mas epektibo ang pagkuha ng gatas mula sa suso ng sanggol sa kanyang ina. Kung kailangan namang malayo ang ina sa kanyang sanggol, mas mainam naman na hand expression ang gawin lalong-lalo na sa unang araw ng pagsasanay dahil mas gamay ng ina ang kanyang sariling suso, mas makakapa ang mga paninigas o pagbubukol ng mga namukong gatas. Bago magsimula sa pag-hand express, kumuha muna ng isang sisidlan na malinis at may malaking bunga nga. Hindi kailangan na ito ay sterilize, ang mahalaga lamang ito ay malinis at tuyong-tuyo. Hugasan ng kamay gamit ang sabon at tubig. Hindi na kailangan linisan ng suso o ang utong sa bawat pagkakataon na mag-hand express ang ina. Gamit ang lapat ng iyong mga daliri, marahang i-massage ang iyong suso, magmula sa kilikili, paikot hanggang sa gitna ng iyong suso. Gamit muli ang mga lapat ng daliri, suportahan ang suso mula sa ilalim at ilapat ang hinlalaki sa itaas ng utong. Habang nakasuporta ang kamay sa suso, itulak ang kamay papalikod at pagdikitin ang mga daliri. Pagkatapos nito, marahang i-relax ang mga daliri nang hindi tinatanggal ang suporta ng buong kamay sa kanyang suso. Ulitin ang mga hakbang nang hindi binibitawan ang suporta sa suso. Sa umpisa, maaaring wala pang makitang gata sa unang mga hakbang. Ngunit habang ito ay patuloy na ginagawa, inuulit-ulit at habang nasasanay ang ina, ay mas magiging mainam ang pagdaloy ng gatas. Alright. And the second lactation skill is the self-breast massage. Although not sufficient to achieve increased milk supply on its own, self-breast massage helps stimulate the mother's breast to release oxytocin, relieve engorgement, provide relaxation, and allow the mother to visualize her own breast milk. Using the palm and the finger pads, gentle but firm strokes are applied to strategic parts of the body, especially to the breasts, to stimulate contraction of the milk glands. Arugaan is a non-government organization founded not only to give these services to mothers in need, they can also provide skills training to breastfeeding counselors and health professionals like us. If we can replicate these skills to the mothers, they will be empowered to do it themselves. Letter I stands for itapo ng bote. This might be the hardest step in relaxation. However, practically speaking, not allowing the babies to see, smell, feel their favorite bottle or pacifier will make them unlearn more easily their nipple preference. And they will eventually get to know again the sight, the smell, and feel of the breasts again, and eventually will prefer the breasts. However, when the baby absolutely refuses to suckle directly, it is important to teach the mothers how to cup feed as an alternative feeding method. They should be encouraged to try breastfeeding again once the baby calms down. It is important to lead them through this skill as they need the confidence to practice it and teach it to their caregivers. Ang pagpapainom ng gatas gamit ang isang maliit na baso. Una, siguraduhin maghugas ng kamay gamit ang sabon at tubig. Sa paghawak ng bata o ng sanggol, suportahan ang kanyang katawan, ulo at leeg nang habang siya ay gising. Pwesto para nakataas ang kanyang ulo. Ilapat ang bibig ng tasa sa labi ng bata o sanggol hanggang ang gatas ay kanyang malasak. Huwag ibubuhos ang gatas. Manatiling ganito lamang ang posisyon at ang sanggol na mismo ang iinom ng gatas. Kapag tumigil ang sanggol sa pag-inom, Tsaka laman tatanggalin ang baso. And 
last but not the least, K stands for kangaroo mother care or skin-to-skin -skin contact. Skin-to-skin -skin contact does not only work with the premature and low birth weight babies. Theoretically, it regulates the infant's temperature, breathing, and heart rate as it mimics the warmth and the smell of the mother's womb. We found out in our study that uninterrupted skin-to-skin -skin contact of at least two hours per day helped the babies get to know and readily take the breast of their mothers. This is the stage for quicker relactation success. Now that we know the important elements of successful relactation, we go to the next mnemonic, the name SUSO, to discuss the signs that show that relactation is going well. For signs of a successful relactation, we make use of the mnemonic SUSO. The first letter S stands for satiety or satisfaction. This is the first and the most reliable sign that relactation is going well. A hungry baby who takes in a mouthful of milk could be seen vigorously suckling and afterwards will be found to be calming down, relaxes the body, and you can see that the hands will no longer be tightly fisted. Instinctively, a relaxated baby will let go of the breast once full and may fall asleep or stay comfortably awake once satisfied. The mother would also find it easier to decrease supplementation as days go by because the baby already gets satisfied more easily. The second letter, letter U, for urine output. This is one of the most reliable signs of adequate hydration. A baby who takes in enough breast milk urinates at least six times a day, starting at six days old onwards, and the urine should be pale yellowish white in color. And at least the mother or the father would find that once the baby urinates, it makes the diaper become heavier. There should also be no tinge of reddish or orange discoloration, which can signify uric crystals, a sign of dehydration. If the baby doesn't have these red flags, then baby is being fed adequately. The third letter, letter Letter S stands for a settled baby. When not feeding, a settled baby may be comfortably asleep or awake. It also affords more restful hours for the mother in between. A settled baby also is willing to take the breast for feeding or comfort. You may find this more and more as days go by in a successfully relaxated diet. O stands for observable changes for the mother and the baby. Due to more efficient positive feedback mechanism during relaxation, the mother may notice heavier breasts as they fill up more easily. And once the baby finishes a feed on that breast, it becomes softer. Signs of letdown reflex may also be felt, such as tingling sensation from the base of the breast to the areola, or milk dripping on the other breast while the baby is lashed may also be felt. They may also notice increased milk output when they attempt manual breast expression. You must remind the mothers, however, that frequently measuring their milk output is counterproductive as the baby takes in more by effective latching than what could be expressed by hand. Concurrently, a mother who is doing well during relaxation would find herself getting more rest, albeit still intermittently because the baby still needs to feed at different types for the day. At least, they do not need to prepare for bottle feeding. Furthermore, the mother may notice that the baby starts to fill up within the next few days of successful relaxation. She may be able to notice the cheeks, the arms, the legs, the buttocks to appear fuller. Even without using the weighing scale, the baby may seem heavier when carried or lifted. And finally, a sign of adequate nutrition in an infant is when their developmental milestones remain at par with age. There you have it, the mnemonic balik suso for the elements of a successful relaxation. Now we go to the tips to ensure success. You know, I have been helping different mothers for almost six years to relaxate. And my personal tips for the health professionals who would like to join me in counseling these moms are first, 
relaxation is not for the faint of heart. They should first be determined to trust and undergo the process. Sure, the first two to three days would be difficult, but they must keep on. I have counseled some mothers in tears and some of them on the brink of giving up. But those who were able to push themselves more or less achieve their feeding goals. We must be available also to give counsel and assurance throughout the relaxation journey of the mom. They need all the boost and encouragement that they can get during the process. We must not give them false hopes, only to leave them out to dry. Third, we must be able to constantly monitor and assess the diet's progress. Only then can we help the mother form and then adjust realistic goals as days go by. We must understand their context and be ready to tweak some steps to suit their day-to-day -day living. Reassess and then allow them to readjust their goals. And lastly, we must know when to refer to experts when breastfeeding or relactation is not going well. We need to be able to congratulate them on how far they have come. Any progress is progress, whether the efforts to maximize the results have been done or not. Acknowledge them for their desire and determination. After all, we are just here to guide and help them through their journey and let them realize their progress themselves. I would like to end this lecture with the picture of one of our enrollees. I obtained the mother's permission to share this. So this is baby Ruth and her mom. So she was admitted because of ileal stenosis and was severely malnourished because of it. After the surgery, uh, once she was deemed stable and the order non per orem lifted, the other doctors initially wanted her to be fed via an orogastric tube, despite her showing signs that she's already ready to be fed orally. So when the mother learned that she can already be fed orally and safely, she became adamant to relactate. So ref she refused the OGT feeding. So her mother requested for clearance and indeed the baby was cleared. Ruth was cleared by her attending physician, her um, gastroenterologist, and her surgeon, um, and uh, after being included in our study, because she already satisfied the inclusion criteria, she was enrolled in our study. So from day zero, um, she has no uh, intravenous fluids there, and she has already been fed directly per RM. So can you see the difference between day zero to day 14? Um, where she underwent the intervention. And she's still uh, undergoing the intervention until day 21. And day 21 was her last day inside the hospital. She went home after that. And then she came back as outpatient on day 30 and day 60, respectively. So you can see the differences. You can see her cheeks filling up, her arms filling up, and she's happier. You can see her um, temperament. She's happier. And the mother is also happy. And you can also see that long-haired woman over there is me. Now, Ruth is already seven years old. And aside from uh, um, some occasional bouts of coughs and colds and fever, she has never been confined again for sickness and is doing well in school. Her younger brother was also exclusively breastfed as an infant. She and all the others who were successfully breastfed after being a fully formula fed are just one of the testaments that relaxation is indeed feasible despite resource limitations in our country. With that, thank you very much for listening and I hope you have learned a lot from my lecture and I hope uh, you can also help other mothers who want to relocate. Thank you very much for listening. Research on breastfeeding is important to promote best practices and influence policies on breastfeeding and maternal and child care. To proceed with the research presentations, 
We welcome back Dr. Laniza Hamoy. We now proceed to the research presentation segment of our program. Our first presenter earned her degree in medicine from the Bicol Christian College of Medicine. She's currently the president of the Human Milk Bank Association of the Philippines and the medical specialist at the Dr. Josefa Bellia Memorial Hospital. To present her paper on knowledge, attitude, and intention towards breastfeeding among pregnant adolescents in two tertiary hospitals, let us welcome Dr. Estrella Olonan Husi. Good day. I will be presenting to you our paper entitled Knowledge, Attitude, and Intention Towards Breastfeeding Among Pregnant Adolescents in Two Tertiary Hospitals. With its proven benefits on both the mother and her child, breastfeeding is recommended by the World Health Organization and the UNICEF to be initiated within the first hour of birth and be continued exclusively for the first six months and beyond. According to the Global Breastfeeding Scorecard of the WHO, 40% of babies under six months are exclusively breastfed. Even if there are strong evidence on the benefits of breastfeeding, it was noted that there is a low breastfeeding rate among adolescent mothers in the United States. It was noted that since 2003, breastfeeding rate was going down and some of the identified challenges include stigma and embarrassment, lack of parenting readiness, and need to be accepted by peers. Challenges faced by these young mothers, such as breastfeeding difficulties felt in the early postpartum days, lack of practical knowledge and support from health professionals, led them to discontinue breastfeeding. Thus, they are perceived to less likely to breastfeed than any other population group in many countries. The National Demographic Health Survey of 2013 and 2017 reported a similar pattern of breastfeeding rates and showed that 85% of Filipino children under six months are breastfeeding, with rates dropping to 51 to 60% among children 12 to 23 months old. Nevertheless, few studies have investigated breastfeeding among the adolescent population. There is a dearth on the data regarding knowledge, attitude, and intention of pregnant adolescents on breastfeeding. Hence, this study was intended to help the health professionals who work with adolescents understand the gaps in the knowledge, attitudes, and intention towards breastfeeding, therefore promoting the importance of breastfeeding as well. Furthermore, this will help in the formulation of strategies and interventions that will improve breastfeeding initiation and duration among adolescents, thereby improving maternal and child health outcomes. Since this study was conducted in just two tertiary hospitals, external validity may be limited and further studies, such as cohort studies, should be done to further determine the association between knowledge and practices among adolescent mothers and breastfeeding rates. These are the terms used in this paper with their corresponding definitions. This is the research question. And these are the general and specific objectives. This is a cross-sectional study using a survey questionnaire to collect data among pregnant adolescents seen at the Teen Mom Clinic of the Philippine General Hospital every Wednesday and Welcome Teens Clinic of Dr. Jose Fabella Memorial Hospital every Monday to Friday. The sample size for knowledge and intention towards breastfeeding was computed to be 81 and 96 respectively. This research conducted for one month was reviewed and approved by the Ethics Research Board. Prior to asking the participants to answer the questionnaires, informed written consent was obtained from participants who were 18 years old. 
For those younger than 18 years, consent was obtained in this manner. From 15 to under 18 years, a cause signed informed consent with parents or guardian. From 12 to under 15, a simplified assent with signed parental consent. From 10 to under 12 years old, verbal assent with signed parental consent. Sampling was done for each participant using survey questionnaires that were self-administered or assisted. The questionnaires include questions pertaining to demographic data, sources of information, and social support on breastfeeding, knowledge, attitude, and intention towards breastfeeding. Demographic survey and validated questionnaires were used in the collection of data. The validated questionnaires on knowledge, attitude, and intention towards breastfeeding were lifted from the previous study published in the Philippine Pediatric Society. The collected data were entered into a database using Microsoft Excel spreadsheets. Knowledge, attitude, and intention responses were scaled and scored. The more correct answers, the higher the score. Data were described using means and standard deviations, frequency counts, and percentages. Statistics for continuous variables such as t-test and chi-square for categorical variables were used to analyze the data. For all tests, a 95% confidence level was used. The following are the results. For the sociodemographic profile, this graph shows that half of the respondents were 16 to 17 years old, followed by 18 years old at 34%, and the remaining 12% belong to the 14 to 15 years old age group. Majority were in high school. 62% stopped going to school when they became pregnant. All remained single, 57% lived with their parents, more than half had partners older than the respondents ranging from 18 years to 26 years old. Respondents are mostly from Cavite, followed by Metro Manila with 28% from Manila and Paranaque 12%. 91% were preemie gravids and 9% when were on their second and third pregnancies. More than half of them are at less than 30 weeks age of gestation at the time of the study. 74% had their prenatal checkup at the health centers while the rest went to a lying in or to a private hospital. 9% did not have any checkup. This graph shows that the hospital where they would deliver was the most common source of information about breastfeeding, followed by the family, health center, and the midwife, and the internet, and social media. This graph, on the other hand, shows that the respondents have their family as the source of support for breastfeeding, followed by the health professionals, such as doctors, nurses, midwives, friends, and their partners. This table shows the proportion or percentage of respondents with correct answers to the knowledge questions. It can be seen that the average proportion with correct answers was only 51.1%, and a third were not sure of their answer or did not know. Respondents were well aware or knew of the infection fighting ability of breast milk, of its economic benefit, that it promotes bonding between mother and child, and that frequent breastfeeding increases the amount of breast milk, and believe that water helps increase milk supply, which is a misconception. As for the rest of the questions, the proportion with correct answers were under 50%. Only a fourth knew that exclusive breastfeeding can decrease the chance of pregnancy, that breastfeeding can be continued even if the mother was sick, that the mother's breast will not get inflamed with early and frequent breastfeeding and that the size of the breast does not determine the amount of milk of the mother has. The attitude towards breastfeeding 
was noted to be generally positive at 78.4%, scoring 3 to 4 in the Likert scale. All of the pregnant adolescents intended to breastfeed after birth except for one respondent. 80% intended to breastfeed until the child is 2 years old, while 20% showing no intention to do so. The most common perceived barrier to breastfeeding among the subjects is going back to school or work. The perceived lack of sufficient knowledge about breastfeeding and feeling embarrassed about breastfeeding in public were the next most common perceived barriers. Others mentioned were fear of pain, limitation of social activities, and lack of interest. This table shows selected factors that can influence intention to breastfeed up to two years. A positive attitude was significantly associated with intention to breastfeed up to two years with a p-value of 0.007. And significant association was found between going back to school or work as a barrier with no intention to breastfeed up to two years with a p-value of 0.0003. According to the 2017 National Demographic Health Survey, one in 10 Filipino young women aged 15 to 19 years had begun childbearing, where 8% are already mothers and 2% are pregnant with their first child. Adolescent mothers are known to be more at risk for adverse health events compared to their adult counterparts and that should be a concern for health professionals and other policymakers in terms of prevention of adolescent pregnancy and promoting health for adolescent mothers. Because of the young age of the mother, most often still a child herself, the task of taking care of a child becomes a Herculean task for the adolescent mother who also needs caring and nurturing. This, there is no official breastfeeding rate among Filipino adolescent mothers yet, but in the United States, breastfeeding rate among adolescent mothers is lower, lower than their adult counterparts and has been dropping since 2003. Although majority knew the benefits of breastfeeding, this study was consistent with the findings in several studies that showed a low overall knowledge about breastfeeding in these adolescents. There was a big percentage of respondents who had misconceptions about actual practices that could hamper or impede successful breastfeeding, such as stopping breastfeeding when the mother is sick, breast size as a determinant of amount of milk, colostrum not suitable to give to the baby, that frequent and early breastfeeding can cause in inflammation of the breast, among others. 78.4% of the respondents have a general positive attitude on breastfeeding. Attitude was significantly correlated with intention to breastfeed. Question 15, or breastfeeding, even if one must go to work or school, had the lowest proportion of subjects agreeing at 47%. Clearly, more than half of the respondents did not see how breastfeeding could be continued given this situation. Like the findings of Nesbitt, this study showed that all but one intended to breastfeed immediately after birth. Notable, however, is that only 80% had the intention to breastfeed up to two years. In our study, going back to school or work was the main barrier to continuation of breastfeeding that was cited. This stems in part from their lack of knowledge and or discomfort with breast milk expression by hand or pump, not having a private place to express their milk for their baby at school or other places, and not having the skills to prevent or manage common problems like pain or leaking. To sustain breastfeeding, institutional support is warranted. In the Philippines, pursuant to the Expanded Breastfeeding Promotion Act of 2009, all health and non-health facilities, establishments, 
including workplaces and schools, were mandated to establish lactation stations. The Department of Labor and Employment granted break intervals in addition to the regular time off for meals to breastfeed or express milk, provided that such intervals shall not be less than a total of 40 minutes for every eight-hour working period. However, there is no available data in breastfeeding and lactation stations in school. A number of adolescents felt it was embarrassing to breastfeed in public. Some reported to have received judgmental stares while breastfeeding outside. The gathering of breastfeeding mothers was a campaign to make the public be aware of breastfeeding and to dispel the misconceptions and stigma on breastfeeding. Majority had correct knowledge about the benefits of breastfeeding, but there was low knowledge about practices and skills that could sustain successful breastfeeding. Attitude was highly positive, and the majority intended to breastfeed immediately and up to two years. The most cited barrier to breastfeeding was going back to school or work. There was a significant association between attitude and the most cited barrier to successful breastfeeding, which was going back to school or work with intent to breastfeed up to two years. These are the recommendations of the study. In particular, for those who intend to go back to school or work, knowledge and skills on how to express milk from the breast, handling and storage, how to feed may help to overcome the most commonly cited barrier. Thank you. Our next research presenter earned her medical degree from the University of Santo Tomas Faculty of Medicine and Surgery, did her pediatric residency training at the Philippine General Hospital, and her fellowship in developmental and behavioral pediatrics at the Medical City. The presenter paper entitled Effect of Skin-to-Skin -Skin Contact on Success of Breastfeeding in Term or Near-Term Neonates Born by a cesarean section, a meta-analysis, let us welcome Dr. Glenna Katrina A. Gray Bautista. Good day. I am Dr. Glenna Gray Bautista, and I am here to present the results of the meta-analysis I did in 2015 entitled, Effect of Skin-to-Skin -Skin Contact on Success of Breastfeeding in Term or Near-Term Neonates Born via Cesarean Section. I also like to give credit to my co-author, Dr. Casahara, and to our advisors, Drs. De Ocampo and Kilendrino. From an evolutionary standpoint, neonatal survival is dependent on close and continuous maternal contact. This is contrary to what has been commonly practiced in the 20th century, especially in the industrialized countries, where the infant is quickly separated from the mother and dressed immediately to be placed on his own crib. This practice has been governed by rigid hospital directives and through the years, data has shown that there is an increasing rate of infant morbidity and mortality. Because of these findings, the World Health Organization has formulated the Essential Intrapartum and Newborn Care or the EINC which is a set of guidelines now adopted by the Philippines Department of Health. This is in response to the objectives of the United Nations Millennium Development Goals of reducing maternal and newborn mortality rate. EINC delivers time-bound interventions immediately after the delivery of the newborn. Two of the core steps in EINC are early skin-to-skin -skin contact between the mother and infant dyad, and the non-separation of both parties for, S for early breastfeeding initiation. A number of studies have shown different positive effects of breastfeeding for both infant and mother. Short-term benefits include release of oxytocin from the mother's pituitary gland, which stimulates contraction of the uterus to prevent postpartum hemorrhage, and stimulates the milk letdown reflex and natural contraception in the first six months, if exclusive breastfeeding is done. Long-term benefits include optimal metabolic profiles, reduced risk for maternal reproductive cancers, 
It facilitates emotional bond between the mother and infant, reduced rates of infant morbidity and mortality, higher intelligence quotient for the child, and a decreased financial burden to the growing family. Compared to spontaneous vaginal delivery, cesarean delivery is associated with increased risk for lower APGAR scores, respiratory problems, and hypoglycemia in the newborn baby. Studies have shown that early skin-to-skin -skin contact between the mother and the child may alleviate these risks, hence highly recommended. This study aims to conduct a meta-analysis on the effect of early skin-to-skin -skin contact in healthy term or near-term neonates who have been delivered via cesarean section compared to standard hospital practices of placing the newborn infant under radiant warmers or in cribs. The main objectives are initiation of breastfeeding and, have, and having better infant physiologic outcomes such, such as thermoregulation, respiration, cardiac, metabolic, and urologic status. All randomized control trials for early skin-to-skin -skin contact be between mothers and their healthy term or near-term born infants were compared to the usual hospital practices. Participants were mothers and their healthy term or near-term infants who had skin-to-skin -skin contact within the first 24 hours of life. For the purpose of this study, term infants were born between 37 weeks and 42 weeks age of gestation, and near-term infants were those born between 34 and less than 37 weeks of gestation. Studies with the following subjects and or procedures were excluded from the final analysis. The primary and secondary outcome measures in this study were the following. Archives searched included PubMed, Cochrane Database of Systematic Reviews, Cochrane Central Register of Controlled Trials, and Google Scholar using a combination of keywords and mesh words. Two review authors independently reviewed all potential articles selected through the different search strategies. After taking into account the inclusion and exclusion criteria set for this study, two full-text journal articles made it to the list for review. Both studies were randomized controlled trials, who advocated early skin-to-skin -skin contact after cesarean delivery of term and near-term neonates. The characteristics of the included studies are shown in this table. The review authors individually extracted data from the included studies. Data were entered into the Review Manager 5.3 software or the RevMan 5.3 and checked for accuracy. The risk of bias for each included study was independently assessed by the two review authors using the criteria outlined in the Cochrane Handbook for Systematic Review of Interventions. The authors have concluded that both studies were valid with overall low risk of bias. This slide shows the pooled data of the effect of skin-to-skin -skin contact on the time of, to initiate feeding in term and near-term infants delivered via cesarean section. The mean difference of negative 32.14 showed a significant benefit of early skin-to-skin -skin contact compared to routine care in having a shorter initiation time for infants to breastfeed with a 95% confidence interval. There was statistically significant difference between early skin-to-skin -skin contact and routine care with a C-score of 2.95 and a p-value of less than 0.05. Test for heterogeneity showed chi-square of 0.83 and i-square of 0, making the studies homogeneous. On the other hand, this slide shows the pool data of the effect of skin-to-skin -skin contact in the infant's thermoregulation capabilities. A mean difference of 0.06 showed no significant benefit of early skin-to-skin -skin contact compared to routine care in achieving thermoregulation with a 95% confidence interval. There was no signif statistical significance between early skin-to-skin -skin contact and routine care with a C-score of 
0.47 and a p-value of 0.64. Test for heterogeneity showed chi-square of 1.93 and i-square of 48, making the studies homogeneous. The results of the secondary outcome measures could not be pulled because they were mentioned in either of the journal articles only. In summary, the pooled results indicate that there is a significant benefit of early skin-to-skin -skin contact in achieving earlier breastfeeding as compared to routine care in neonates born via cesarean delivery. However, the pool data shows that there is no significant effect in the infant's ability to thermoregulate if early skin-to-skin -skin contact is employed compared to routine care in cesarean-born babies. In conclusion, this study provides evidence that early skin-to-skin -skin contact has positive effects, especially in the success of breastfeeding compared to routine care, even to those infants delivered by a cesarean section. The Western culture has taught us that the conventions for delivery and care of a newborn infant, and we are having difficulty practicing the EINC because of this, this pre-wired knowledge, more especially in the setting of a cesarean delivery, where there are more difficulties and intricacies being encountered in the process. For future trials planned in this line of research, a larger sample size should be employed to have better measurement of treatment effect. More outcomes should also be examined to provide the consumers or reviewers a wider view of the possible effects of early skin-to-skin -skin contact of our infants born via cesarean delivery. These are my references. Thank you all for listening and good day. Our final presenter earned her degree in medicine from the Manila Central University and did her residency in pediatrics at the Adventist Medical Center, Manila, where she became the chief resident. To present her paper on the prevalence and predictors of exclusive breastfeeding among mothers after hospital discharge amidst the COVID-19 pandemic in a tertiary private hospital in the Philippines, a cross-sectional study, let us welcome Dr. Dr. Jan Erika C. De Las Alas Tabligan. Dr. Gretlin D. Creed says, A newborn has only three demands. They are warmth in the arms of its mother, food from her breasts, and security in the knowledge of her presence. Breastfeeding satisfies all three. Good afternoon. I am Jan Erika De Las Alas Tabligan, and I'll be presenting my research paper entitled Prevalence and Predictors of Exclusive Breastfeeding among mothers after hospital discharge during the time of COVID-19 pandemic in a tertiary private hospital in Pasay City, a cross-sectional study. There is nothing more precious in infants than the gift of breastfeeding. It remains the ideal method of feeding infants, rendering benefits especially both for the mother and the child. Yet, only one in three infants is exclusively breastfed in the first six months of life. The World Health Organization, together with UNICEF on year 1991, implemented the Mother Baby Friendly Initiative, which is a global effort to promote and support exclusive breastfeeding. In the latest published statistics done globally last October 2020, 49% of newborns were breastfed within one hour of birth, and 44% of which were exclusively breastfed in the first six months of life. In Asia, there is an estimated 50% of newborns being breastfed for the first hour of life and 57% of which were exclusively breastfed from 0 to 5 months of age. This percentage of exclusive breastfeeding infants for the first 6 months of life ranked first among the other continents. According to the Global Nutrition Support in the Philippines, the latest prevalence data of exclusive breastfeeding in our country is 33% of infants ages 0 to 6 months. This number falls short from the 2030 global target of 70%. Globally, it shows that more than 800,000 under 5 deaths per year can be prevented by breastfeeding. However, despite the significant evidences available with the effects of breastfeeding, the Philippines still has a low percentage of mothers who practice exclusive breastfeeding. The novel coronavirus greatly affects the lives of people around the world. The health protocols in the hospital setting were vividly revised to safeguard patients 
But one of the things that remained well-founded despite the global threat of this pandemic was the implementation of exclusive breastfeeding even among mothers diagnosed with COVID-19. This is my general objective. These are my specific objectives. This is my methodology. The questionnaire for the study was patterned from a study of Sonko 8 et al. in Ethiopia. The author was approached by email and was asked for permission if his research questions can be used as a guide in this study. The author himself emailed his questionnaire indicating his approval. For this study, a modified questionnaire from the Mother Journal was done in order to be applicable in our setting. It was originally constructed in English and was translated into Filipino by a language expert. Records of those who gave birth from January 2020 to January 2021 were retrieved from the obstetrician census where in cellular and phone numbers of each patient were noted. Out of 890 newborns delivered from January 2020 to January 2021, 887 fit the inclusion criteria with a target population of 317. All included in the study were entered in a Microsoft Excel file and was randomized. The first 317 population size was approached via direct phone call. Only 155 of the first 317 answered the call and verbally consented. Hence, the consent form and the questionnaires were sent through their emails. To complete the study population, the next 300 on the list were contacted. Among those who were called, only 531 gave their email address and a total of 355 mothers had a written consent and participated in the study. Some of the reasons for declining to participate in the study were, were the following. A computer-based informed consent, both in English and Filipino, before proceeding to the questionnaire, was part of the Google form wherein willing participants should click first in order to, to proceed to the question. The data collection was conducted firsthand by the author of the study. The sample size was computed based on the following. Study participants that met the following was included in the study. And the only exclusion criterion, newborns with congenital anomalies. The following were used for analyzing the data. These are the results of my study. Most of the participants were at the age group of 31 to 35, followed by the 25 to 30 years, which shows that the population of this study were mostly of childbearing age. The majority of the participants were married, college graduate, employed, and having their first child. This table shows the percentage of maternal factors affecting exclusive breastfeeding. Those that were backed showed the majority of the answers of the respondents, delivered by a CS, term babies, received information about unang yakap, received information before and after giving birth. Pediatricians and social media as number one source of information about exclusive breastfeeding have previous breastfeeding experience, no abnormalities in the anatomy of the breast, no maternal illness during pregnancy, not diagnosed with COVID-19 during pregnancy. Those who plan to breastfeed before delivery and those with breastfeeding support from their husband or partner other family members, and healthcare providers. This table shows the percentage of neonatal factors affecting exclusive breastfeeding. Those that were backs showed the majority of the answers of the respondents. Male sex, more than 12 months of age, weight within 3,000 to 3,499 grams, early initiation of breastfeeding done, did not receive breast milk substitutes, no intervention done after delivery, and those that received intervention majority of which had antibiotics treatment. This table shows the percentage of hospital practices affecting excessive breastfeeding. Columns 2 and 3 pertain to the questions if baby was separated from the mother, at what age was the baby placed skin to skin and breastfeeding initiated. Majority of the children were placed skin to skin immediately after delivery and were roomed in after giving birth. Majority of the mothers know what is exclusive breastfeeding and most of them believe that it improves maternal health and that it provides bonding and lower the risk of infections with their babies. 
more than half of the total respondents gave pure breast milk on their babies for the first six months of life, with 165 of them still breastfeeding exclusively, while 190 of which stopped exclusive breastfeeding. The major reason for stopping breastfeeding was the perception of mothers that they do not have enough milk. In this study, the prevalence rate of exclusive breastfeeding is 63.9%. Three factors showed significant association of maternal demographic profile with exclusive breastfeeding. Age in years, civil status of being married, and unemployment status. Those who received information about unang yakap and breastfeeding benefits prior to giving birth and after giving birth showed significant association of maternal factors affecting exclusive breastfeeding. The other significant finding were those who have no abnormalities in the anatomy of the breast and those who did not have maternal illness during pregnancy. This table shows that the following neonatal factors were not significant in this study. The same thing goes with the hospital practices. This table shows the significant maternal perceptions affecting exclusive breastfeeding. This includes mother's perception that breastfeeding can lessen uterine bleeding and that it can benefit babies by preventing cancer, hypertension, diabetes, malnutrition, and obesity. After multivariate analysis using logistic regression, 10 variables were found to be predictors of exclusive breastfeeding. On maternal demographic data, it includes maternal age, maternal status of being married, mother's educational attainment, Maternal factors affecting exclusive breastfeeding of being informed about benefits of breastfeeding before and after birth and having no abnormalities of the anatomy of the breast, with neonatal factors unable to receive breast milk substitutes while in the hospital. With maternal perceptions of the benefits of exclusive breastfeeding on the mothers, this includes less uterine bleeding, while perceptions of mothers on the benefits of exclusive breastfeeding on babies includes prevention of cancer, hypertension, diabetes, malnutrition, and obesity. For my discussion, these studies show that the prevalence rate among mothers after hospital discharge was 63.9%. This number is almost two times higher than the rate in the global nutrition support in the Philippines, which is only 33%. This is higher than the other neighboring countries in Asia. Majority of the respondents fall under the age group of 31 to 35 years old, yet it was in the younger age group of 18 to 25 years that showed significant findings in the study. This is invalidated by the study done by Sarah D. MacDonald, wherein older women had higher odds of exclusive breastfeeding. As mentioned above, Younger age group tends to depend on social media platforms wherein topics are provided on the tip of their fingers, which was agreed upon by the study of Kumar et al., which showed that the practice of exclusive breastfeeding are seen among late adolescents who are often exposed to social media. In this study, being married had a significant impact on exclusive breastfeeding practice with a three times higher chance of practicing exclusive breastfeeding than participants who are not married. This is incongruent with the study of Hagos et al., wherein married mothers practice exclusive breastfeeding four times higher than unmarried ones. In terms of educational attainment, significance was seen on those who were within the group of high school graduates. This was opposed in the study done in Indonesia and Bangkok, Thailand, which shows that higher education tends to give mothers more possibilities of exclusive breastfeeding. Participants who received information on breastfeeding before giving birth had a two times higher chance of exclusive breastfeeding their babies, while participants who received information on breastfeeding after giving birth had an almost three times higher chance for exclusive breastfeeding. The same goes with those participants without abnormalities in the anatomy of the breast. Participants who did not receive breast milk substitutes while in the hospital had an almost three times higher chance to exclusively breastfeed their babies. Similar findings that in Ethiopia were in mothers who did not practice pre-lactal feeding were twice likely to exclusively breastfeed. The following had a two times higher chance of exclusive breastfeeding with regards to maternal perceptions. 
These are the limitations of my study. In conclusion, age, civil status, and educational attainment have great impact on mothers' decision-making to practice exclusive breastfeeding. Adequate information before and after birth regarding exclusive breastfeeding is essential. Pediatricians and social media play an important role in disseminating information to the public. Support in the family, especially husbands, encourage mothers to exclusively breastfeed their child. These are my recommendations. Breastfeeding is not a choice. It's a responsibility. Let this be one of our greatest responsibilities as pediatricians. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you very much to all the speakers and the presenters. And thank you to our audience who have stayed with us to listen until the end. Unfortunately, we do not have any time left for a live Q&A, but we will try our best to address the questions directly through the Docuity app. We would now like to award the Certificate of Appreciation to our speakers. The certificate reads, the Philippine Pediatric Society, the Philippine Obstetrical and Gynecological Society, together, and the University of the Philippines Philippine General Hospital awards the Certificate of Appreciation to Dr. Maria Julita Sibayan, and the same to Dr. Joanne Detangel Gallardo. In grateful recognition of their invaluable contribution as speakers for the 10th Philippine Breastfeeding Congress entitled Roadmap to Breastfeeding Success, Creating Systems for Lactation Support held on August 10 to 11, 2023. We also award a certificate of appreciation to the following research presenters, Dr. Estrella Olonen Husi, Dr. Glenna Katrina Gray Bautista, and Dr. Jan Erika de las Alas Tabligan. Thank you very much again to all our speakers and presenters. In grateful recognition for their um, research paper presentation during the 10th Philippine Breastfeeding Congress entitled Roadmap to Breastfeeding Success, Creating Systems for Lactation Support. Thank you everyone once again for listening and actively participating in this afternoon session, this evening session. Some reminders and announcements would like to remind everyone to answer the post-test and evaluation forms. You can access them by cl clicking on the tab and it will be open at the end of the sessions. For those paying delegates who are listening through the YouTube channel, please still answer the post-test questions and evaluation forms through Docuity to get your certificates. The link to the post-test and evaluation forms will be sent to you via email. The link to the breastfeeding handbook has been closed, but we will send individually to the emails of paying delegates the revised version with better quality pictures. Thank you for your understanding. You may also visit the virtual booths of our sponsors for the 10th Breastfeeding Congress at the virtual exhibit hall. And now for the closing remarks, we would like to introduce the President of Child Foundation and the Chair of the Department of Pediatrics of the Philippine General Hospital, Dr. Marisa B. Lukban. Good evening, everyone. This afternoon, we learn from three lactation experts on commonly encountered problems and challenges based, faced by our breastfeeding moms and how to solve them. We learn on how to solve the problem of low milk supply. We learn from our nurse expert, Dr. Julita Sibayan, on how to encourage children with oral impediments to breastfeeding, such as those with cleft lip and palates. And lastly, we learn how to support families for relaxation from Dr. Joanne Gallardo. I hope that you can impart what they taught you this afternoon to all your patients and friends. In addition, we also would like to thank Drs. Estrella Olonan Pussy, Glenna Katrina Gray Bautista, and Jan Erika Alas Tablingan for sharing the researches with us. Medical research, whether clinical or qualitative experiential research, is indeed one way to bridge what we learn in the clinic and see how this knowledge bears an impact in the lives of our patients. 
To all our participants in this breastfeeding congress, I wish to encourage you all to utilize research in your everyday practice and life. Magandang gabi po sa inyong lahat. And this officially ends the 10th Breastfeeding Congress, reminding everyone that the post-test and evaluation form are now accessible. Good evening and see you again next year!